Today, we're gonna be taking a look at Umbreon in a Pokemon Crystal solo run. This beefy little moon kitty, it's gonna be the second bulky Pokemon I've done in a row with Lantern being last. And I always find these tanks to be the more interesting style of runs, personally. Welcome back to the channel where I like to do Pokemon solo challenges with the ultimate goal to rank Pokemon against each other after a series of runs and optimizations. The rules and pretty much everything you could ever possibly want is down in the description. So please check that out if you are interested. And if you are a returning subscriber, like Harvey Metalark. I do appreciate the support. Grab yourself that Sodi Pop and let's just dive into it. We're not gonna waste any time today. We're gonna hop straight into that setup information. Like I alluded to earlier and get used to me just saying this a lot, Umbreon is a tank. It has high HP, it has really high defense, and it has extremely high special defense, but it's at the cost of offensive power. 65 in attack and 60 in special attack. It's not necessarily bad, but it just means that we're not gonna hit very hard and we're not gonna be relying on one shots today. 65 speed to me is that sweet spot where you really don't have to worry about it. Uh, you're not gonna outspeed everything, but most things you will. It's not really elite, but it's not gonna be a detriment. The level up learn set is next. Tackle and Tail Whip, they're not gonna inspire confidence, but you do get an early sand attack and you can kind of channel your inner Pidgeotto or Sandshrew. You can squeak past maybe Cheese early challenges. And honestly, the rest of this, not too great. Where things are a little bit sad to me, a little bit lackluster is the TM learn set. Umbreon, unlike Lantern, by the way, it gets things like Mud Slap, Swift, Headbutt, and then you get things that every Pokemon get like Hidden Power and Return. But outside of that, there's not much going on here. Iron Tail's not great, low accuracy, Steel's not a good offensive top. Shadow Ball's not really going to help us solve any issues on its own. And you do get Psychic eventually. Pretty good, but it is locked behind the Kanto section of the game. So the early consensus here looking ahead is that Umbreon will almost exclusively be doing neutral damage, chipping away at opponents, outlasting them with Supreme Bulk, and that should probably be your expectations for the run overall. As for the early stages of the game, the only thing to note is that I'm picking up extra berries. I don't want to heal too much. I don't want to go to centers. I don't want to visit marts early. There's two extra extra berries here in the early game. You get the one that you start with as well. And I noticed through several playthroughs that you just get beat up a little bit too much in the early game and this really helped out. We went against the total dial starter today. The rival, it's generally inconsequential, especially when you're outside of that fire, grass, water triangle, but we just tail whip into tackle here. Not much to really say overall. Afterwards, to get to that best straight line path to the end of the game, it starts early by going against the first three trainers in the game. It's Joey, Mikey, Don. They're just bug catchers. No need to dive into them. But really quickly, I would like to just really quick touch on something that I will elaborate more at the end of the video if you're interested, but it's something that I needed to talk about. Now to keep this very short, very sweet, times four speed on real life time does not mesh with the way that I like to make content. Here, for example, you want a Bellsprout as a cut user. Very simple. If you fail to see one here, maybe you get unlucky after Faulkner, it's essentially a dead run. You wasted like 10 minutes and you just have to start over. Now this is not a huge time sink on its own, but at the later the game goes on, where maybe you get unlucky or maybe you just make a simple mistake, the worse it gets and the worse it feels to have to start over. Now we're gonna see this way later in the video, what ultimately led to me wanting to talk about this, but it just wastes way too much time for me and it can be really frustrating. I don't wanna babble on about this. Like I said, I'll elaborate more at the end if you wanna hear it, but the way my life is set up and the allotted time I have to make content means that I simply cannot afford to do five plus runs just trying to get that result, fighting the real life clock, and I want to make some changes, but let's shelf this conversation for now. We'll come back to it later so we can continue the flow and enjoy the run more. Now, Umbreon, it leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of damage, so the Sprout Tower is a great option today. This is where the extra berries come into play, and I know a lot of you love the held items. I love them too, and if you've noticed, I have overhauled the held items on the overlay. You can see the berry. It's on a chain around my neck, and I've been drawing my own thumbnails lately, and I have made a set of custom some held items for the run. So just kind of keep a lookout as the run progresses. You'll see more held items. Tell me what you think about it. Overall, this is the part of the game. It's a little monotonous. You just kind of tail whip and the tackle. And by the time we make it to Sage Lee at the end, we are level 11. And then when you fight the two trainers in the gym, that will get you up to level 12. We smack around Bird Keeper Rod. And now I think we can just take a look at Faulkner. Faulkner. 
he leaves with a very scary, I'm shaking in my boots, level 7 Pidgey. And the extra levels means this one is just a simple matter of one tail whip into a tackle two shot. We can move on to the end. On the Pidgeotto, you could probably just attempt to use some tail whips, lower its defense, and go straight damage. But I go the more devilish route. To ensure the victory, I do set up several sand attacks before I use tail whips to debuff it. And after a slow and steady battle, tackle does its job like it's supposed to. And that gets us the first badge. Now it's worth noting that you could do this battle earlier with Sand Attack Cheese, but in the optimized run, you kind of know the trials and the tribulations that are waiting up ahead, so getting this easy experience now just helps going ahead. Overall, Faulkner was not a problem for this run, and I didn't see the need to level up any more than I did. Getting access to Mud Slap is also helpful since we don't really have any extra coverage, so let's keep it going. Just like with Lantern, I will be getting that pink bow today. It's a win-win situation. We get to see the pink bow on the overlay early, and it kind of smooths out our weaker attack stat to help ranges in upcoming fights. As far as Route 32 goes, and I guess Union Cave, I don't pick up any extra battles, but we do get access to Swift. It's a significant upgrade over Tackle. It's very welcome, but the first challenge of the run, and it's something that we haven't talked about in a while, is Hiker Anthony. Now, ultimately, I decided a faster route was more important than doing something like getting to level 15 here. And this one, I'm just gonna keep it straight with you guys. It was kind of a roll of the dice. By the time you get done with Union Cave, you only have a couple of mud slaps left, and you need to use them on Geodude. So when Machop comes in, you kind of just need to say a little prayer and hope the sand gods come through. I do get hit early for some solid damage. I set up three sand attacks and you would think that it would be good. But Hacker Anthony, he just says, nah, bro. He gets a crit with low kick through the sand and things are kind of up in the air at this point. I go for swifts and luckily the accuracy debuffs do their job like they're supposed to. And I survive. We are in red health, but it means we don't have to restart the run. We can just keep going. Let's get past the Slowpoke Whale, and today we are directly diving into the second rival battle. We just hit level 16, and we have access to Pursuit, so the Ghastly is not an issue, and the second Pokemon is Zubat because it has Leech Life. The more annoying thing here is going to be getting confused like it always is, but after a few Swifts, we take it out, and at the end, it's going to be another battle of attrition here. I don't use Sand Attack or Mud Slap, I just go straight damage, I'm able to outpace it, we get the victory. Now this battle isn't particularly interesting, but it's key to move around the order today because this experience combined with Bugsy's trainers means that we can hit level 18 for that sweet damage rounding threshold and now we can just take a look at the second gym. Like always, Metapod and Kakuna, they're whatever. Since Dark is a special type here, it's more efficient, it guarantees the two shot, so I use it. But this gem is getting a showcase today because Dark type is weak to bug, and Scyther can be pretty tough if you don't plan for it. Now I'm not going to act like this is some elaborate or well thought out plan like the Lantern Flail strats, but we simply, we just want to set up Sand Attack, that's it. Throw some sand in its eyes. Fury Cutter gets stronger and stronger each consecutive use, but the first hit is extremely weak. If you can make it miss, even just once, you're going to win, and it's as simple as that. I did lose at earlier levels when I was testing this out. I had some dead runs. So the level 18 strat, it emerged as being more consistent, but this one, you see it here, it's pretty clean. The last time we played Crystal, we could not learn Headbutt, and I'm still going to be talking about that because Game Freak hates Lantern, so it's good to see it make a return here. After that, just like a child, it's time to be a good little boy and do our chores. We do the usual things like we get the bike, we get a haircut, buy an Abra, we kidnap Kenya, and we hang out with our favorite trainer, Juggler Erwin. He's just out here holding it down with a level 2 Voltorb, so it's always good to see him. Up next is Whitney, and for the first time in a while, it was actually a bit of a headache. I'll hit level 23 after the Clefairy, and it's a simple two shot with headbutt but the mill tank gave me fits the idea is very simple mud shot lower its accuracy so it can't build up that rollout and we just slowly outpace it the problem is that our damage isn't great and milk drink makes this a complete slog i'd also like to say in practice i've never seen a pokemon hit through accuracy debuffs as much as i did here one time it hit four stomps in a row despite having maximum accuracy debuffs and it goes without saying that things like that can be extremely frustrating this one is just extremely long and while Level 25 would help. I just wasn't willing to sacrifice the extra time to do slightly more damage here because the battle pretty much felt the same regardless to me. I just really want to stress that this battle kind of embodies the things that Umbreon isn't great at. We do win, but this fight felt awful. 
afterwards, I'm able to pick up return. Now notice on the left near the HP is a three digit number. This is our friendship number. I wanted to add this into the overlay for two reasons. The first is that you can't pick up return until you are at 150 friendship and it's nice to know. And the second is for returns damage. Now the calculations for damage for return is simple. It's friendship divided by 2.5. And what that means is that you will not out damage headbutt with return until 178 friendship. Although I do often hold off on it longer than that, but it's just really good information to have at your fingertips. Now we can jump ahead to Ecritique. Umbreon proves that it's gonna be the superior evolution by taking out all the kimono girls. And today I'm gonna to make the hard pivot down to the lighthouse to tackle this part of the game first. And you might think, hey, Umbreon should be really good against the third rival, it shouldn't be too bad. And then you have the ghost gym leader, so you should it should be free and you should be able to do all this right now. But at our current level, the haunter can curse you. You're not really doing a ton of damage and things like curse or paralysis can make it a bit iffy and since I'm gonna have to skip the order anyway to avoid Chuck for a little bit this was the safer play in my opinion when we get done with that we can actually look at the next rival battle and we're gonna see that the extra lighthouse training really didn't do too much Umbreon just it doesn't hit hard we'll just say that pursuit it still cannot one shot the haunter which means it's gonna get off a curse and that was my biggest worry here I hated to see it the positive here is that I do hit level 28 and the extra damage just means that we can avoid like Zubat shenanigans like a supersonic we headbutt it down and I'll keep it real with you guys we just get really lucky on Magnemite here the mud slap fails to knock it out and to be fair thunder wave could have missed since we used a mud slap anyway but it does go for sonic boom it misses so we avoid being paralyzed and thank God for that at the end of the day I can still outpace and I can win this battle but you can see that curse really started to add up here we do get through we, we slip through the cracks with our life but it wasn't that clean now a solution to make this more consistent would be to hit level 28 before the fight but like you just seen it is possible to do without the extra training and the ebb and flow of speed versus consistency it's always something that I think about but today I chose speed it was close but we did clutch it out now it's time for Morty and it goes without saying that the top matchup is very much stacked in our favor the only reason we didn't do this earlier is because it's locked behind the burn tower rival fight and we just went over that not much to say here other than we do get shadow ball I don't really want to elaborate on it but it I don't use it in the run. It never helped out in any situations. Next up, we're heading east, and that means the Lake of Rage and some extra training before Chuck. Now, we can talk about hidden power now. Usually in my videos, it's color-coded for the top, and if you look down there today, it's just normal. And that's gonna be because I could not figure out what hidden power I wanted to use. I used like five different kinds. I tried Psychic because it makes sense, because you're not lowering your attack. It gives you super effective damage on Chuck. I messed around with Flying, since you can get the sharp beak outside of Olivine. And then I even tried just straight full DB's Dark, since it would be stronger than any other dark move we can learn in the game. I actually didn't end up going with any of those, and for now, we're gonna leave the conversation here. We'll progress in the game a little bit, and we'll come back to what and why I decided on what I did for Hidden Power. Now it's time for the rocket hideout. It's quick, it's easy, but that extra experience is helpful when you have a Chuck weakness, and that's really all we can say about it today. And next up, we're going to go directly to Price right after it. Like most times in this run, it's going to be a battle of attrition. Get used to that. Just like tank attrition, we're going to say that a lot. The only thing I'll say here is that Price is a weird gym leader. He's the weirdest gym leader in the Gen 2 games, in my opinion. He's located in an area that looks like it should be the seventh gym leader, but the levels of his Pokemon are only like 27 to 31, and it just it feels off. Now, much like the rest of the Johto leveling curve, but myself and everyone else has pretty much touched on the leveling curve as much as it is we get the win here we can finally get our feet a little bit wet that means it's time for that brisk swim down to cyan wood and we can just skip ahead we know what everyone's kind of wondering about and that's going to be Chuck, brother You see at the top here, you might have seen it earlier too, uh, Hidden Power is actually ground. Let me talk about why. It's because you simply do not need super effective damage to deal with Chuck because Umbreon's attacking stats, they're just never going to allow you to get a one shot here. I like Psychic and Dark because the special Hidden Power types don't lower your attack DVs. 
But as we'll see soon, there was just a big wall we needed this ground hidden power. But let's actually talk about Chuck at least a little bit. As for Polyrath, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm not going to say that dynamic punch doesn't hurt. And you guys already know that Chuck is going to hit it 100% of the time and get the confusion proc. But I'm telling you guys, this little moon kitty, stop me if you've heard this one before. It's tanky. It can soak just about anything in the game. And we can just outlast Chuck. We get past the fighting gym. We don't need to use a specific hidden power for it. And I guess that felt pretty cool as well. But this one's done. Now that we have Fly, the world is our oyster and we can clean up and do some backtracking. On the menu today is the World Island Rare Candy. It really doesn't take too long to get and I'm going to need it in a bit. Next up we have the Rare Candy in the PP up in Violet City. Then there's a Nugget and a Rare Candy south of Goldenrod. Those are all very standard. Now south of that, we've talked about it before, there's three cool trainers. You go there, you defeat them and you can get soft sand and that's going to boost our hidden power damage. And here's something that's pretty new. It's a the Charcoal Backtrack. It's something I'm going to start doing a lot. It sells for as much as a nugget it takes like five seconds to get so i think it's really worth it and now let's kind of shift our focus over to jasmine i do want to draw attention to the soft sand it's a little bucket i drew and i think it's pretty great but without hidden power ground i was actually having to use candies here for jasmine on earlier iterations of the route it was just really slowing down the run because even when you use candies it was a bit of a slog everything we had outside of mud slap was resisted and it was just a huge huge roadblock the biggest in the entire run if you can believe it so let's kind of just dive into it and talk about it there's not really much to talk about here it's not going to look like much because the first two magnemites they're just one shots if we're talking about the earlier strategy when we had to rare candy to like level 43 mud slap even then wasn't a hundred percent chance so they could get off like maybe a paralysis and it just made things really annoying but it's not the main course for this battle now for the 15th time in this video i'm going to say that this was a battle of attrition even with the 70 base power ground move with the soft sand this one is still pretty close I do some pretty solid damage, but not a ton. And still, it can actually deal back a lot of damage because a stabbed Iron Tail has 150 effective power. And after it gets a potion to heal it back to full, I barely outlast it here. I end the battle with just 15 health. And I'm not being hyperbolic here when I say that this was the worst fight in the game without optimization. It cost not only a bunch of time, but I had to sink a lot of finite resources to kind of get this to feel reasonable. And honestly, this is the only spot where Hidden Power Ground was just mandatory. It was a must. But I think you know what time it is. We get that dreaded phone call. It's time to beat up 54 Rocket Grunts with level 19 and 20 Rattatas. And we're actually going to look at some footage here today while we go over some things. It's worth noting that Hidden Power, it also gives you a bigger PP pool for this section that's very important because you don't really want to heal psychic did fill the same role and it does it better because it can hit things like the zubats but if you use the hidden power anything over, other than ground or psychic it means that you just have a heavier reliance on return it just speeds things up a little it felt pretty nice now we're actually looking at the next rival battle we never look at the rival this late so you know we're in for some shenanigans and this is just going to be a showcase of umbreon's shortcomings and it's worth talking about I can't one shot the gold bat, that's fine. Nothing of value is lost here, I don't get confused. But on Magnemite, I'm actually out of hidden power PP. And that's just my fault. That's just poor resource management, and it's actually gonna cost me here. Due to how overpowered steel is defensively in Gen 2, it actually resists dark as well. So it's a slog, and we get paralyzed, and we start to bleed health, and things are looking pretty bad. I actually do win this fight, but this was a blunder that really hurt. Like I mentioned earlier, I made a slight miscalculation, and the only options at this point is to keep pushing ahead with a bit of a scuffed run, or just stomach the 46 time loss. Just check it off of my limited free time, and you can see that I chose to press on since we're watching the video now. This was frustrating for a multitude of reasons because I had been working on a new route. There's a max ether down here and I was banking on that to kind of bridge the gap to not have to heal and it was going pretty good, but I just, I messed up. That's all there is to it. Having to actually leave here, go back to the Poke Center after I realized I don't have any extra ethers, it tilted me off the face of the planet because I was already having a lot of trouble getting the footage for this run, getting it going. But I do think it's important to kind of show the shortcomings here, talk about all of that kind of stuff just as much as it is to show great strategy, but it is what it is. So this segment did cost us some time we could just skip ahead a little bit afterwards i do pick up some vitamins the main thing to note is the five carbos there's also some proteins there's a little calcium in there not too important 
and that'll take us to Route 44. Now, I'm actually gonna grind strangers today. I'm not a big fan of grinding anything optional in this game. Everything's so weak, but when you have a weak attack stat, it just really can't be helped. This means that after the first trainer in Claire's Gym, I'll hit 48. And this is the point where I'm gonna dump all of my rare candies, pretty much all of them, into our little moon kitty, hit level 53, and it's gonna set our experience up for later. And the only other thing to mention here is Moonlight. I opted to go for it in the learn set today. It only heals 25% health in most situations but with as bulky as we are it's usually enough i'm not really going to touch on it too much at the moment but that's going to lead us straight to claire for the final badge and 53 just makes this one to where there's no nonsense the dragonairs they're going to fall in one return it makes it fast it makes it simple the kingsure can take some hits but we just got the stats just the tank whatever and it uses a smoke screen it uses a hyper beam eventually we hit our couple of returns and that's another major battle down now to prepare for the Elite Four, I do grab the Mount Mortar Rare Candy, and I pick up a few extra trainers heading towards the Indigo Plateau. It's going to get me up, ultimately it's level 57 is where we're at after the last rival battle, and without further ado, there's not much more to say, I think we can just dive straight into the Elite Four. First up is Will, and I'm not going to waste anybody's time here. He's a psychic type trainer, I'm a dark type. We do have some extra levels, we have super effective damage, and if I can say anything about Will, it's that he actually makes Umbreon look like an offensive force here. There's mostly one shots and it feels pretty good, and it, it goes how you think it would go. There's no reason to linger in this fight. Koga's up second, Hidden Power Psychic does help a little bit here, and by help I mean it saves a few seconds here and there. Like most Elite Four runs, Fortress is just tanky and only fire can one shot it so it's a little bit of a slog and while the rest of the battle plays out I'm gonna talk about my interest in fortress it's really high on my list of gen 2 runs I want to do and I'd like to know how bad you guys think it would be and keep in mind that I don't mean bad like Meganium or Lantern I don't know why you guys think those runs are bad like do you think it's gonna be like a two-hour run or something like that Bruno is up next and this is another instance of Umbreon going into a bad matchup now just like with Chuck we don't need to do anything special here neutral damage is good enough and when we make it to the Machamp Bruno, he doesn't want the smoke. He just goes for that foresight. He can seize the match. And at the end of the battle, it's just an onyx. So it's over just like that. If you thought Bruno was going to be a problem, you got a lot to learn, kid. Looking at Karen, we can go into that mythical Umbreon mirror match. Obviously, we got the huge edge because we got stat experience, levels, and return. But all you can really hope for here is not to take a sand attack. And luckily, it misses. And we get through this part just missing a minor amount of health. Bob Plume isn't too much of a threat offensively, but you already know what it's trying to do and we get paralyzed and while we didn't get hurt we kind of just have that hanging over our head now it doesn't really matter when we look at the murkrow because it's just an incredibly weak pokemon and on the houndoom it's another good example of the weaker attack costing a little bit of time even the super effective ground damage can't one shot it and when you consider it gets a potion plus me going second due to paralysis it just kind of holds us up even more we've seen that several times in this video in the back there's a gengar and there's a reason why karen is trying to hide this thing in the back and now it's time for the champion This one, it's not fun to watch. I do use the last of my candies here, and I'm gonna go ahead and tell you guys, I made this battle much harder than it actually needed to be. We'll get to that. As for Gyarados, it's really simple. It's generally gonna go for Rain Dance, and two returns can take it out, so we, we just move on. The Dragonite is where the problems come in. We've talked about this several times, but this is gonna be the huge mistake of the run. If you didn't know this Dragonite, it, it just wants to go for Thunder Wave. And I really didn't put too much thought into it. It wasn't awful in the practices, but it, here it turns out to be the biggest routing mistake that I made. We'll talk about the mistakes that I made, but just know that starting over was not an option. You can see that I can still, even after getting paralyzed, I can just slowly progress through the fight but going second, taking constant chip damage, it makes this one awful. Overall, I do have two resets here and it's really infuriating because the solution is very easy and there's actually more than one solution. The first solution is not really the most elegant one, but you could just basically just equip a paralyzed cure berry and you'd be perfectly fine. The second one is that you could use rest, you could get rid of paralysis and you could win easy that way. I can't stress enough how unfortunate it is that this cost me a solid two plus minutes. And this is the big reason that I'm gonna make some crystal 
changes just so that this type of blunder can't really show up in videos in the future and I can have a easier time getting the footage but it is what it is we're about halfway through an hour and seven minutes we got a couple of resets under our belt now but like I've said a few times I'm not restarting my fifth Umbreon run this deep into it but that wraps up the Johto segment of the game we are the league champion let's fade to black we can pick back up in Kanto Now you guys know how it goes by now. Kanto, it's weak and every battle is pretty easy. There are things to get like Psychic and Leftovers on a tank is really powerful, but overall, we're in here for a quick pit stop. It takes about 20 minutes of real life time. And let's just jump ahead. We'll just cover blue real quick. And for the first time in a while, we don't even need an intro here. You just, I'm, I'm too over leveled. And I don't mean that I fought extra trainers. I went out of my way. I just mean that the leveling curve in Gen 2 and the bare minimum track, it just brought me to the state where it's already going to be a clean matchup anyway, but our level makes it that much more one-sided now. Return in general, it just it can do work and I've talked ad nauseum about the bulk and it I just kind of coast here there's not really any profound analysis or in-depth strategy to speak of here I just kind of win Now I would like to touch on something that I talked about last week. I think that using candies early to help you get ranges and overall speed up the early part of the game is the way to go in these Gen 2 solo challenges. I think if you have to grind on the horribly inefficient and low level trainers, it's just going to slow you down a lot. If you get to the end of the game and you need levels for red, just don't grind any regular trainers. Now if you want a solid idea to be put in your head, the levels in trainer battles outside of the gym leaders in Kanto is levels 27 to 38 and that statistic is a little misleading because there's only five a whole five battles that have a pokemon that's either level 37 or 38 and the vast majority we're talking 90 to 95 percent of the kanto pokemon are only in the high 20s or low 30s it's bad grinding the elite four it's just more efficient that's just all there is to it and maybe i'll put some extra work in sometime to maybe prove it but you see me enter the elite four here notice i enter at about one hour and 21 minutes and we move ahead a little bit I finish up my second full run with six extra levels about six minutes later. Now keep in mind that Umbreon is not a powerhouse. I still can't one shot everything and I'm just fighting through the paralysis on Lance. But the important thing is that I get to level 75. I have three extra rare candies I didn't use and now we can take a look at red. Now seriously, if you have not tried to play crystal where you don't hoard every single possible resource for red, try it. The results are great. Not only does it feel better, but I'm 99% sure at this point that it's actually actually faster. We probably need a Gen 2 race to prove that. I'll put my belt up for grabs, but let's take a look at red real quick. Level 78 is ultimately what you needed, what we decided on for the consistent battle, and it's for one big reason. Now keep in mind that the TM for Curse is banned, so we did need to be much stronger than you would need to be without it. Around level 73 is where you start to get pretty good Pikachu ranges, but in the grand scheme of things, it's gonna be insignificant. But after that, the Snorlax is coming up. And like most runs, this is gonna be the sole reason that we needed three to five extra levels. Rest would highly likely be the better play over Moonlight here, but I have a little set going here where I can kind of stall with Protect, get some leftover regeneration. And I'll be honest with you guys, I just don't like the move Rest. I try not to let my buys come through in these solo runs, especially when I'm playing a Pokemon I don't like but sometimes I'm stubborn and I'm often stubborn with rest this one ultimately comes down to something I've mentioned a ton lately it's a battle of attrition you already know two tanks slapping each other with wet noodles and the only thing that can really be a huge detriment here is paralysis like it has been for the entire run but at this point we're such a high level it's not really the end of the world even if you do get paralyzed thankfully in the footage we don't even see it and I just spam return but I will say I hope you guys enjoy the new leftovers image that I made up it's a masterpiece I think. A little half-eaten burger. Umbreon's a little boygy boy. Now, like I said earlier, Snorlax, it was the reason to go for level 78. Everything else felt pretty awful, pretty inconsistent. And the only thing to say about Venusaur is that Sunny Day does make Moonlight essentially a recover clone. It goes from 25% health recovery to 50%. It doesn't really make sense why the sun being out would strengthen a moon-based move, but I recommend not thinking about it too much. Charizard turns out to be a bit of a weird one. It's a little bit of a hassle. It does a lot of damage. It can burn you, but that can be pretty annoying. But honestly, 
What shocked me here was how little damage I was doing to it. Charizard felt like a pretty big tang. I don't know what it was. But at the end of the day, it's fine because I have Moonlight. I have Leftovers. I have Protect. I'm very resilient at this point. And even though we kind of seesaw back and forth with the Blastoise, Umbreon is just too tanky. And unless something lowered our defense and maybe it's just railing off dynamic punches back to back to back, I just don't see how we could go down in this fight. And at the very end, Red, he's trying to hide that Espeon. I'm licking my chops. I'm saying, mm-mm. It's time for dinner. But we actually, we don't have a dark move right now. So we just use return a couple of times. Nothing that return can't handle. And that's going to make the run over for real. Umbreon beats Red with a time of 1 hour 30 minutes with 2 resets. And it's a shame that a poorly thought out Lance fight and some other little mistakes cost us several minutes. Since we just timed the blue splits here mainly, Umbreon's going to have a time of 1 hour 20 minutes and 36 seconds. And it's got that red time of level 78. This puts us just a shade under Meganium. And I think that's a pretty good spot. Now in the coming weeks, I'm probably going to ask you guys some questions regarding Crystal talk about some of the changes I want to make because I really do enjoy playing these games. It's always a treat. They look fantastic. They're always really fun to me. But just like Gen 1, we're going to have to play a bunch before the rules and kind of the style I want to do really take hold. And we're just going to have to play a lot more in general just to get really efficient and really good at the game, making the content in general. But it's just, it's something needs to change. It's not there for me yet as a creator. Now, as always, special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support, it just goes a long way. And if you're listening to this now, you're a real one. And I just really appreciate it, guys. All the love, all the support on every video. I like the community. You guys are always so nice, understanding, helpful with everything. And even though I get busy, there's nothing quite like the feeling of just like sharing your love for Pokemon and runs and stuff like that sharing it with other people so it means a lot to me so if you made it this far I really do appreciate it like a lot like I know it seems like I just say it at the end of every video but I really do but I have a little bit of time right now uh, I need to get to work on the next video I'll catch you soon bye